Good evening, everybody. I have a quick question. Um, if I were a college professor, do you think I would be on time for my classes? <laughs> Just for that, you're staying after class. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. You're on time? <laughs> Praise God. Well, good to see everybody tonight. Everybody doing okay? Did you start your New Year's um, off on the right foot? Have, has anybody broken any of their resolutions yet? You there you go. <laughs> I feel, hold on. I feel a high five is in order. I'm feeling drawn over here. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, glory to God. Well, why don't we just stand up for about 30 seconds, amen. I know I'm sure everybody's had, a, well, we may not have had long days today. I don't know. Is anybody back to work today? You know, praise the Lord. Let's just take a moment, amen. Let's just thank the Lord uh, for uh, his word, a new day, a new year. Father, we just thank you tonight. Glory to God. We thank you for your word tonight, Father. We thank you for... Uh, the body of Christ. Lord, thank you for this local church, Father. We thank you for the plans that you have for each and every one of us individually and corporately. Lord, we just come to you tonight and we ask you to just give us uh, insight and revelation, Lord, in your word tonight. I pray that you would speak to each and every individual here by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that resides on the inside of each of us. Lord, I ask you to give me bold utterance tonight, clear and concise. Bring all things to my remembrance, and we just give you the glory and the honor, Lord. We just celebrate uh, another day and another year that we get to serve you and to do your work uh, on this earth. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Glory to God. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles... I'm thinking about turning over, I am thinking about this New Year's resolution, though, about, um, you know, uh, speaking shorter um, in 2023, so I'm going to see if I can make it past <laughs> week one before breaking that. Um, I'm sure if anybody, if anything we can release our faith on tonight, I'm sure we could agree on that, amen? Uh, no, let's turn uh, to Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one. Uh, the Lord put this on my heart uh, this past week for tonight, and uh, I believe it's fitting and uh, it's important, and uh, I believe that I, I know that this subject tonight is super powerful and uh, can just cause tremendous things to uh, open up in each and every one of our lives and uh, as well as our corporate destiny, our destiny that's together. Amen. I want to start, uh, I'm going to read starting in verse 1, but I'm uh, the part of this uh, chapter that I want to focus on is in verse 15 through 23. But I want to kind of get the foundation of uh, what this, this chapter is. Amen. So I'm reading from the New Living Translation, I believe, yeah. So let's start with verse 1. Everybody say, I'm listening. Hopefully you're reading along with me as well. Starts out, uh, this letter is from who? Okay, it says, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God the Father, God, I'm sorry, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, oh, I love this verse, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Now, if you have a, you know, you're making notes or highlighting That'd be a good one to mark there. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, verse 3, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. <clears throat> Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ 
to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. That's a little part I'm going to highlight in just a few minutes. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was, Paul writing this, that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now, the rest of us, you Gentiles, have also heard the truth the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we could uh, we would praise and glorify him. Man, glory to God. Ever since I first heard, now this is getting on into verse 15. <coughs> Excuse me. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom, everybody say spiritual wisdom, just making sure you're listening, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the place of honor uh, at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Does anyone have a New King James translation handy? Can I use that really quick? Oh, whoever's, thank you. Gotcha. I want to read this uh, verse 15 in the New King James. Um, verse 15 uh, but 16 rather it says do not cease to give thanks for you paul making mention of you in my prayers that the god of our lord jesus christ the father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation everybody say wisdom and revelation 
wisdom and revelation, the spirit of wisdom. Does anybody have an amplified translation in here? Well, they can get it up back there, amplified. I'm going to finish this one here, though. Uh, the, uh, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Uh, do you have that in the Amplified, if you could put that up? <clears throat> Okay, so he said, for this reason, uh, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, for I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom. This is the part we're going to focus in on tonight. A spirit of wisdom and revelation. So wisdom and revelation. So the Amplified adds to that and says, of insight into mysteries and secrets insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him amen let's see what verse 18 says by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light uh so that you can know and understand the hope uh which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints his set apart ones Let's see, uh, and so that you can know and understand what the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty uh, strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That's good. Um, uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1, this is again uh, the Apostle Paul, and it starts out here. Everybody good? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, When I first uh, came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words, uh, lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you uh, that, that this always makes me feel encouraged here to read this. I did not use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. Glory to God. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching was very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches <laughs> i don't always kick i didn't get a kick out of that uh instead of using clever uh, and persuasive speeches i relied on the power of the holy spirit isn't that a revolutionary idea i did this so that you would not trust in human wisdom but in the power of god glory to god yet when i'm among mature believers Actually, if you separate these two, and I'm not getting into this tonight, but the first few verses there, it really is what the world needs to experience at their first take at the gospel. They need to hear it and see it demonstrated in the power of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, as we've seen in, in, the, in the modern Christian era here, it's all about the external and the eloquence and the you know what we can see and 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 all that stuff but paul had a different approach i'm gonna bring you what this is all about glory to god what is it all about it's about a power and a demonstration of something it's not just me giving you an eloquent speech and letting you oh maybe gain some insight in your understanding no he's saying i'm gonna show you what this really is right and and that's the way that the world should experience the gospel Listen, that's what brought me in. I've never been enticed by a, a clever speech yet, right? What brought me in was a move of the Spirit of God. And I said, that's what I want to walk in. Amen? And the world will be the same way. They don't care how, many, how great things look. They don't care how beautiful our sermons are. The world needs a demonstration 
They need a demonstration of what this really is. Right? You ever try to convince someone about the gospel? Sometimes, you know, that's just not going to work. But if they see something and experience something, right, of the power of God, that can oftentimes, wow, really cause someone to turn and to look and to say, I need to find out what this is all about. That's what Paul is saying here. It's by his own experience. But he goes on to say this. Um, Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom. But not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or the rulers of this world. I'm glad I'm here tonight. I really need to hear this. Who are soon forgotten. I want to read that verse again. I do speak, yet when I'm among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, Paul said, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. Somebody say the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? That is his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. Man, this is so good. The wisdom that Paul spoke is the wisdom pertaining to the mystery of God. Amen. Which is what? It's the plan uh, that was previously hidden even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But, he goes on to say, the rulers of this world have not understood it. Now, this was 2,000 years ago. And the rulers of this world still do not understand it. They do not understand the mystery of God's plan, even though it's been revealed. It says... um, The rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Listen to this. That is what the scriptures mean when they say, we've all maybe, most of us have heard this verse or quote this scripture, quoting an uh, Old Testament verse. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us. Somebody say, that means me. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. Amen. What's he talking about? The mystery, the wisdom, the plan of God. Amen. It was to us that God has revealed these things by his spirit. Uh, It says, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one uh, can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And man, this is powerful here. And we, somebody say that means me. And we have received the, or received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know. Somebody say, I can know. We can know the wonderful things God has freely given to us. Amen. Uh, Going back to the the prayer um, in Ephesians chapter 1, if uh, you're familiar, we obviously talk a lot about uh, Kenneth E. Hagin. Uh, In his book, uh, The Authority of the Believer, he starts the book um, with the first three chapters of Ephesians, and he tells his uh, story of how 
Um, he prayed he, by, you know, inspiration, insight, whatever. He realized that there's two prayers in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, one in chapter one, the one we read tonight, and there's another one in chapter three, verses 14 through whatever it is, 21. And uh, he said that he realized uh, by, uh, the, the, by illumination of the, of the Spirit of God that these prayers were anointed prayers given by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul for that specific time and to the church at Ephesus. But Brother Hagen realized that these prayers were also applicable to you and I today. Amen. So he said uh, he began to pray these prayers. Uh, he was a pastor, I think, for 11 or 12 years up to this point. Uh, he had already been raised from a deathbed, uh, healed uh, supernaturally by the power of God, by faith in God, uh, cured of an incurable blood disease, a deformed heart, and paralyzed, and who knows what else. Uh, so he had already been walking with the Lord, and he began to pray these prayers, and he said he prayed them uh, both prayers for a period of about six months. Everybody say six months. <coughs> and he said this, he said after six months, he began to see things that he had n never seen before. What began to happen? Well, this prayer began to manifest. Boy, that's a good word, isn't it? Manifest. This prayer began to manifest. What, what, what do you mean, Pastor Jerry? Well, he was praying for spiritual wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. He was praying for wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Everybody say wisdom and revelation. He was praying for that. That's what the prayer says. I wanna, I'm asking you to give a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Amen. So he began to pray that. He prayed it, he said probably, at the end of six months, he said he probably prayed it thousands of times. And he said uh, he began to see things and began to experience things that he had never seen or experienced. He said the eyes of his understanding began to become enlightened. What is that? That's what's in the prayer. It said that the eyes of my understanding, through the spirit of wisdom and revelation, he said that the eyes of my understanding, what's your understanding? Right here between your ears, right? The things that you obviously understand. Uh, spiritual things are sometimes veiled in our heart or, you know, in God's spirit in us, but when they're revealed and, and our understanding get, catches them, then we can kind of, we see it and we get it and we can walk in it, Right? So that, that is a big part of that prayer. So he said, a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of my understanding may be enlightened. Can you imagine walking in a dark room and there's all kind of stuff in there? Or maybe you walk into a, a dark cave of sorts and maybe there's treasure everywhere around you, but it's completely dark, right? Well, what happens if uh, a light was, sh uh, you know, turned on in that place what what would you be able to do you'd be able to see all the things that are around you amen that's what this is explaining here through a spirit of wisdom and revelation given to us by the lord the eyes of our understanding can be filled with light amen and we can begin to see things this is the key for tonight we can begin to see things that have always been there Amen. Let me, let me say this little uh, deal here. Uh, I wrote this down in my notes. We don't have a... Somebody needs to listen to this, write it down, get a tattoo of it. I don't care. It says, well, that's not scriptural, Pastor. Go away. We don't have a getting problem. We have a seeing what we've already been given problem. Much of the Christian endeavor is to try and get something that we have already been given. Amen. Is anybody here? I'm telling you. What, what would cause us to continually seek after things that have already been given? What would cause us to do that? It's one simple thing. We don't know that we've already been given it. 
Hello? For you and I to go after things without, for you and I to go after things that we've already been given shows that we have not yet seen that we already have them. Do you, I'm going to tell you this. Do you realize that you can live your entire Christian life going after things that you already have? Folks, it's, it's, that's reality. You can go after things your entire Christian life that you have already been given, amen, as a result of what Jesus did and what you received when you received him. So we don't have a getting problem. We have a seeing what we've already gotten problem. So Brother Hagin said, you know, after the six months, things began to open up for him. He began to see things he had never seen before. He began to, you know, walk in things he'd never walked in before. Now, listen, folks, this is a man that was healed by faith, supernaturally delivered, preaching God's word, leading others to the Lord, ministering to others that were sick and seeing them well. I mean, he's got, he, he's walking in more already than a lot of us do, right? But he began to, to pray these prayers, and he said he went to his wife one day and said this, he said, honey, what have I been preaching? Because he's pastoring, you know, he's preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever midweek service, whatever services they had. And she, he said to her, honey, what have I been preaching? And she said, well, you've gotten just about good enough where you get up and give a good talk. And I'm thinking, man, maybe, maybe you know, I guess she didn't think to tell him that, you know. Hello? Hello? But he said he began to walk in. And here's the powerful thing about it. Here's where the message, well, you talk about a revolution. Does anybody want a revolution? <laughs> I mean, in your life and in your walk with the Lord and in the body of Christ, a revolution. I believe that Kenneth Hagin, he actually, as a result of just these prayers, he began to step into something that opened up the door to now generations of people that have been impacted by the message. And it's not like, oh, they're Kenneth Hagin's messages. It's God's word revealed. Amen. In that book that I referred to, The Authority of the Believer, The Believer's Authority, whatever it's called. Um, that is probably one of the most powerful messages, at least and definitely in my top hand five, that is the most, probably the, one of the most powerful message we could ever acquire in the scripture. He says in the book, he said, the devil will fight you and I more on that message than on any other message in the scriptures. Is anybody here? He said, the devil will fight you and I on that message. What message? The authority that's been given to every believer. He'll fight that message more than any other message. Why? Because the devil knows that when you and I get a hold of that message, his days of ruling over us are over. So he'll fight you more on that. But where did that message come from? Well, it's obviously in God's word, but there's a lot in God's word. Amen. Hello? There's a lot in there that we have not seen or experienced. Amen. Um, so he said these things began to open up to him and he began to see things. Uh, that he had never seen before. Amen. So he said uh, in the prayer, spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of understanding being enlightened, you, mean that you may know what is the hope of your calling, the glory of the riches in the inheritance. Somebody say inheritance. The inheritance in the saints. Amen. So the hope of our calling. Amen the glory of the riches of the inheritance in the saints, and then thirdly, the exceeding greatness of his power, God's power, 
that works in and through those who believe according to the mighty power of God, which he said, by the way, is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So those three particular areas, the hope of our calling, amen, the glory of the riches of the inheritance, amen, and the incredible greatness of his power that works in and for us who believe. Paul, by the Spirit of God, said those are three in particular things that you and I as Christians, he's writing to Jews and Gentiles, that we would all have our, the eyes of our understanding enlightened in those three areas in particular. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, gosh. You know, it, it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, talking about the devil, you know, uh, keeping you and I from particular messages, you know, insight, wisdom, revelation, and it's true. It's true. Amen. He's okay with you and I having church. He's okay with us coming in and, and, and worshiping the Lord. He's okay with us, you know, partnering with God financially. I mean, he may give you a little fuss in some of the Marys. He's okay with you building a great life. He's okay with you having a successful marriage, the devil that is. He's okay with you raising great children. But when you cross that line, I'm going to tell you what the devil's not okay with. He's not okay when you and I start seeing what God actually did in Christ. And when you step, you start stepping close to that line, looking over, that's when stuff starts shaking around you. That's when things start coming against you. Why? Because he's got to keep us on this side of the fence. If he gets us on the other, if we get on the other side of the fence, it, it's going to, we just opened up a door so that others could follow behind. And the more people that follow behind, the bigger that, wider that door is going to get. And he's going to have a problem on his hands, right? He's okay with 10,000 member churches, the devil. He's okay with churches that have 30, 40, 50,000 people. He's okay with churches that have hundreds of thousands of people. They're out there, right? He's okay with us getting Bibles into prisons and getting Bibles into different places. He's okay with us probably sharing, you know, uh, uh, the message of, of Christ with a neighbor, a loved one, a friend. He's okay with us praying. But when we start getting close to that edge where we start seeing who we actually are and what we've actually been given, that's when he starts to get concerned. Amen. No, I mean, you could look, the devil could say, I mean, most believers, Christians, places, churches, etc. he'll just kind of just let us kind of go on doing what we're doing. Amen. Because we have not yet become a threat to him. Oh my gosh. But when, when I saw this in my heart in, in prayer multiple times, it's like the, the, the scripture says that there's, the, the, it speaks of heavens. Everybody say heavens. So we have the heavenlies, you know, we have this earth realm, and then you get up in the heavenlies, and then you have the third heaven or whatever it is, you know, the term is, where God resides, right? But there's space in between earth and God. It's also called heavenlies, Amen. And that is the domain of principalities and powers and, you know, what we read uh, yesterday, if you were here on, on Sunday morning. Um, that's the, the realm where those evil forces of darkness actually control so much of what's going on on the earth. Amen. And I saw this in my heart when you and I are on earth and we actually go to stand up and we start getting a above where we're going to be we're going to actually climb above that secondary level of the heavenlies amen what happens when you get above that well that's when you and i start ruling and reigning in the actual authority that christ died to give us amen but when you go to get up there and i'm going to tell you what you you would think that every christian or every person or church that their, their, their goal or in their endeavor is to press beyond those adversaries and actually get into a place of rulership and authority and results and productivity in the kingdom. Amen. But I think, and this is by the you know revelation of the Spirit of God, we have been content, maybe, albeit ignorantly, but we have become content living under the canopy of, uh, uh, of those evil forces. We are very much still under the domain, 
amen, of those uh, principalities and powers, according to Ephesians 6, right? We're still under their rulership. Because you, you'd think that everybody's goal would be to get through that. But I'm going to tell you what, ha, what, the more, every time I go to that level, amen, I find out this, it's mighty lonely up there. There are not many that have endeavored to go through that. Why? I mean, it's like one gentleman that uh, uh, has gone to church here on and off throughout the years. He said, every time I go to step into what God has for me, everything goes, starts coming out against me. And I said to myself, welcome to the club. Why don't you get alongside and help push a little bit, push us ahead. No, it's the parable of the sower that I read yesterday. We encounter those persecutions and, oh, I got a word right now. See, you get near the word, you get near the plan of God and watch things in your life will come under attack. They will. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And when you step out into those areas, I'm telling you again, you go up and you look around and you're thinking, Man, I, 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 don't, I don't see nobody up here. Where, where's everybody at? So we remain under that. We remain under that. Now, I've watched ministers that have endeavored to kind of break through, and some have in some ways. Uh, but gosh, it's sometimes it's not worth it. I mean, I know it's worth it because it's the plan of God. But you look at the persecution and the ridicule and the attacks. Um, who was just telling, um, um, oh, oh, uh, the story, uh, what was I telling you about the, the girl at Bethel uh, that her baby passed away? What was her name? What was the baby's name? Olive. There was a story, I just read this in um, a book by Chris Volaton. A great, it's a great book. I forgot the name of it. It was so great. I forgot the name of it, but it really ministered to me. Um, I'll, I'll find it. It's on my Kindle. Laura will look it up and say, find it anyway. But uh, listen to this. He told this story. If many, if anybody, you know, had heard this story a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a family at Bethel Church in Redding, California. Um, I believe they had a, was it a one-year-old, two-year-old? I don't remember. Two years old child, Olive. And uh, she had gotten sick, and the family went to Bill Johnson, or the, the pastors there, and said, would you believe with us for our baby? I think the baby had passed away, and then they said, we want to believe, God, that we're going to raise the child from the dead. And they, they talked about it, you know, the pastoral staff, and they said, listen, we, they, he actually recounted in the scriptures, I think eight instances in the Bible where individuals were raised from the dead. They looked at it scripturally. They prayed about it and said, you know what? I, we can't see any reason why we should not agree with this dear woman who's just lost her child that we can, you know, step out in faith and believe God for this child to be raised from the dead. Now, number one, I got to tell you right out of the gate, that really takes some, some guts to step out beyond what's average and ordinary in the world and say, we're going we're gonna to give this a go. Well, they had, a, a, I think, a full week or two of worship services and prayer times and, you know, all these different things. And at the end of the story, you know, he recaps, and I already knew, the, the child, they did not raise the child from the dead. And one of the most powerful things Chris Volaton said, one of the pastors at Bethel, he said this, I have no idea why the child didn't raise. I have no idea. And I thought to myself, that's powerful. And he said this, he said, if given another opportunity to do the same thing, we'll do it again. He said, because we believe that that is in scripture, amen, and we have a right to pursue that from the Lord. So he said this, but here's the reason I told you that story. He said, they had at one point, I may misquote it, but it's in the general area, he said at one point they had close to 50 news organizations that were there. I've been, we've been to Bethel Church in Redding, California. 
50 news organizations, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, every major news network and, and the not major ones were all there camped out on their church ground keeping up with this story. And Chris Volaton said this. He said, the news people didn't bother me. They never, they never, you know, really got into it with us. He said, do you know what the hardest thing about that situation with Olive was? Other Christians. Other Christians came against them more than any other group of people on the planet about them stepping out into an area that's in scripture. Sure, it's unorthodox in the sense that you don't see a lot of people doing that stuff nowadays, right? At least not in our perfect American Christian world. He said the, the group that persecuted them the worst were Christian people. And he said, I thought to myself, I thought we were one in Christ. I thought we were in this thing together. And then he realized, I guess we're not. So they, they underwent unbelievable amounts. And the crazy thing was they pinned it all on the pastoral staff and it really wasn't even anything that they pursued. That family, that mom came to them. They said, sure, we'll agree with you. Sure, we'll worship God with you. Sure, we'll, we'll pray and believe God for a miracle, whatever it was. And they pinned it all said, oh, Bethel Church, these crazy people are trying to do, and, and it went, after, went after them that hard, mostly Christians. Is that not crazy? So persecution, sure, when you step out and start stepping into some things, I have noticed a pattern, and, and this may be, uh, you know, uh, just me, but I've noticed something in my heart for years. I've seen it. I've experienced it. Those that step out beyond that, well, we're going this way now, that step beyond this operating underneath that realm of principalities and powers, the, those that step out beyond that have encountered some of the most tremendous attacks I've seen. I've seen people that step out to do the will of God. I'm talking about those that step out. I'm not talking about, I don't know where we got this in the, we didn't get it from the Bible, I can tell you that. This brand of Christianity that I call uh, convenient Christianity, that is, those two words do not go together. There is no such thing as convenient Christianity. Christianity means you give up your life to serve God. Amen. So I've seen those that go out, they, as soon as they step out, I've watched them. They come under attacks in their mind. I mean, I've seen individuals that were just normal as the day is long, and all of a sudden, literally just over a short period of time, their, their mind came under such attack that they began to struggle emotionally. I've seen people uh, undergo physical challenges like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I mean, one of the ministers that we worked with in, in years past, um, she was stepping out and doing the will of God, man, just within a, just a, a, the beginning stages of that, she was diagnosed. She had like 26 tumors in her body. Is that, remember what I said yesterday? Is that natural? Is that only natural? No, there is a, uh, a, 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 uh, uh, what's the word? Just a whole bunch of evil forces that are arrayed against anyone that wants to get through that second level of the heavenlies and actually begin to operate in the fullness of the power of God. Amen. This is what keeps me up at night right here. Because somebody used this term, I don't know where it originated, but I kind of like it. It's a little frustrating for me, but the term, a glass ceiling. Has anybody ever heard that before? A glass ceiling. I was in prayer one day, and I had realized, I, I, really by the Holy Spirit, I saw really the, the problem with a glass ceiling. And you know the problem with a glass ceiling is? You know what the problem with a, with a, with a glass ceiling is? It's glass. You can see through it to what's on the other side. If you and I are just pressing on a ceiling and you can't see what's beyond it, you don't know. But the glass ceiling is you can actually see 
what you should have, what you could have, what you can walk in, but you sit, you can't seem to get through that glass ceiling, right? Hello? That's a challenge. But for me, for years, I've seen this is the gospel. This, what, what I'm talking about tonight, this is the gospel. What? That there's a fullness available to you and I that we have not yet accessed. I mean, this, this drives me up the wall. We have been given an inheritance in Christ. We have been given the fullness of the power of God. We have the spirit of God living on the inside of us now. Amen. And that should look like something that it currently doesn't. So what does that mean? That means either one of a couple things. Either number one, we're not seeing it, which is what I'm putting forward today. You picking up what I'm putting down? Either we're not seeing it or we're seeing it, but unwillingly or not walking in it, basically. And that's called disobedience. Right? That's called disobedience. Folks, I got to tell you the truth. I can't hardly live with myself anymore. I mean, I don't even know what to do with myself because I see on the other side and and the whole last month or two, I keep saying to myself, I swear, Darren, when we're, we're crossing over into 2023, this is it. I'm going all the way through. I'm going all the way in. We're going to do whatever we got to do to get to the other side, to see this stuff start manifesting and working and, 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 and start producing something of the fullness of God, or I'm out. Because here's where I've been, and I think some of us have been as well. It's what I call, man, I'm going to ruin my new hat sweating, man. You're making me mad. I call this place that I've been in, uh, No man's land. Does my hair look okay? No. I know I'm joking, but y'all need to hear what I'm saying right now. I've been living in, and I have a feeling more of us have been living. God, I'm going to have to run around this room in a minute. We've been living in this place called no man's land. And basically, it's, it's the wilderness It's not where we were, but it's not where we're supposed to be or not where we're supposed to be headed. So we basically, Mark Hankins puts it this way. He said there's um, uh, pioneers. Everybody say pioneers. There's settlers, settlers, right? Those that have pioneered a little bit, but they settled. And then there's a third group called museum keepers. Amen. Amen. And I think in the body of Christ, there were some pioneers uh, at some point and probably still are a few, uh, but there's a lot of settlers. There's those that got the word, the word of faith, the word of God, maybe in the 70s and 80s or the, the, the charismatic renewal or the baptism of the Holy Spirit started visiting the denominational world. And then there was this outpouring in the Jesus movement, then the teaching movement. Yeah, that brought us farther than we've ever been. But then all of a sudden, folks camped there. They became settlers. Now there's some that are museum keepers. But the purpose of those moves, the purpose of uh, Azusa Street onto the uh, healing revival, onto the charismatic revival, onto the teaching revival, onto the reestablishment of the prophetic and apostolic uh, movement, those things were building blocks that were to escalate and bring us up to where we actually broke through. Hello? But no, no, we've actually settled now. We've settled now and we're comfortable with our charismatic experience of church. We're comfortable experiencing the presence of God, right? We're comfortable living, uh, you know, halfway Christian lives and not so good on the other half, bringing that mess into into the house of God, calling it a Christian lifestyle. We're happy with the lack of consecration or we've settled and we're, we're comfortable with it, right? But I'm not comfortable. I, 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 again, I, I don't know what to do with myself because every day I'm thinking like, I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to quit because it's hard. 
It's hard when you feel like you're pulling. And I know some of us in this room are pulling too. But, man, it's hard when you're pulling and you don't feel like there's much. You're not moving anywhere. Amen. What am I pulling towards? I'm pulling towards what he's talking about. That, that there's an inheritance. There's a fullness. There's an experience in God that you and I should be walking in. Amen. But we look at the Christian world. I've got friends, ministers. Yeah, a couple of them are, I used to think they were way too far out there for me. And I found myself out now in recent, last couple of years, I look around and some of them people I thought were crazy, I'm pretty much standing right beside them now. And I thought, am I crazy? Like, have I gotten that far out there? I feel like my full-time job is to suppress this, what I'm giving you tonight. Why? I don't know what to do with it. I don't know if anybody wants it. I'm just telling you the way I feel about it. I don't know if anybody wants it. You know, like I was talking to one of the guys that does consulting with us uh, here at the ministry the other week. And I said, I, I got a conflict here. I got to spend all my energy keeping down the things that I really want to let out. Why? I don't know if anybody wants it. I don't know if I'm in front of the right, the, the right crowd or maybe I'm supposed to be doing something else or, or just, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do sometimes. But I know this one thing, I want to see it. I want to see the fullness and I've determined this year, I said, I'm going to go out and get it whether anybody else wants it or not. Amen. Craig Sloan prophesied to us and said this. He said the, 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 one of the answers that the Lord gave him for us because, folks, let me just tell you again the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, there is a mega door of opportunity here in front of us. What does that mean? There is a massive opportunity in the spiritual realms for you and I and Melody Church and so many in this community to walk through. This is a promised land. This has been prophesied for, for probably 50 years pertaining to this area that I know of and maybe even some before. Amen. This is a place where God has elected to move supernaturally and to establish his kingdom in this area more than maybe it could be at, uh, right now at other places. We have a mega door of opportunity. Craig Sloan obviously came and preached that, and then he said this. We've talked about this for a couple of years, on and off. And he said this. The Lord showed him in the spirit in a vision. He said, I saw the way through is glory to God. He said, I saw that you and, and staff and leaders and people in the body here at Melody, they would all lock arms in that door, and they would begin to march forward into that door, and all together we would push through. But I want to tell you right now, I believe that we are still on this side of that door. Which for you and I, it should push us into, oh my gosh. It should push us to the place where we are willing to do whatever it takes to get through. I was listening to some message uh, uh, Laura posted the other day of uh, her and I ministering and I said some quote from a Nacho Libre movie. And, uh, he, you know, Nacho Libre said to the, whatever the guy's name is, Skeletto, he said, you know, don't you want to taste, don't you want to taste the glory? Don't you want a little taste of the glory just to see what it tastes like? You're not laughing like they did in that service. <laughs> I do. I want to taste it. I mean, my God, I feel like I've been in a, 3,000 round boxing match with Mike Tyson. I mean, it's like you get knocked down. I'm like, Paul, I've been knocked down, but I ain't knocked out. I'm, I'm all these things, been through all this. I'm still here. I mean, I got scars and uh, wounds and I've been, uh, you know, uh, doctored up by the Holy Ghost and named. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm like uh, the, the, you can't kill me. I just keep on keeping on. Amen. But this is why I'm here, and I believe this is why you're here. So what do we do? Y'all see, y'all got that air conditioning on, man. That's part of that. Hey, that's one of my parts of 
convenient Christianity. We like our air conditioned. You take them padded chairs and air condition and walls and everything else, I wonder who would come to church anymore. We've made it too easy. Jesus made it pretty hard. Uh, yeah, um, uh, my father passed away. I'm going to go attend to his funeral. Um, no, Jesus, no. Just let the dead bury the dead. You leave everything and come follow. But I got my dad's funeral. No, you just don't worry about him. You come follow me. That didn't sound very convenient, did it? How about sell all and give it all away and then come follow me? Elijah telling Elisha or Elisha telling Elijah, burn the plow, kill the oxen, leave it all. Come on, follow me. There ain't much convenience in any of that, is there? But that's the kind of, that's the kind of attitude or person that really God requires to get this job done. And I think the reason we've been dragging along, Peter Daniels, Australian billionaire, said this, the way the church is behaving with world evangelism is like trying to move Mount Everest with teaspoons. The way the church is trying to build the church and establish the kingdom is like trying to move Mount Everest with teaspoons. We're never going to get there. And, and it's like the Joshua generation. I preached this in youth a couple of months ago. The Joshua generation, I think I did in youth, did I? The Joshua generation is the generation that takes the land. It's not about age. It's not about young or old. It's a spirit. The Joshua generation is the one that says, I'm going to go ahead and possess that land. Amen. And I said to the youth that night, you may be the generation. You may not be. It's up to you. It's up to you. Who's willing to pay the price? Who's willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done? Amen. That's what needs to happen. Is anybody here? See, I told you I was going to try to let you go. New Year's resolution, but see... Glory to God. I'm still standing, praise God. I had that song in my heart yesterday on the way to church. Remember that song we used to do, Laura? I'm still standing, not for the grace of God. I'm still here. You're still here. And you ever ask yourself, why? Why am I here? Why did God call me here? What am I called to do? Gosh. I begged the Lord for 10 years living here. Please. Let me move somewhere. And then the Lord, and then I went with Laura somewhere. We had to meet somebody in Bramford and we ate at some place. We were eating frog legs. And then I, I looked around. I said, thank you, Lord, for sending me to Live Oak. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, there's a, I just thought all of a sudden I got real grateful. But, uh, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and I was one of my kids. I didn't want my kids to, you know, uh, uh, you know, go up to New Jersey during holiday or whatever and say, hey, Grammy. <laughs> I thought, no, that's, that can't happen, right? Uh, you know, I miss my Italian food. I miss, you know, but although the Lord has blessed me with some good food around here, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful. But I love it here now. You know, humidity and all. I love it. Humidity doesn't bother me. I love it. I love every second of it. Right? I used to hate it. But I'm here. God's called me here. I want to be here. I want to fulfill what the Lord's called me to do here. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And I tell you, you might could help lighten. We could lighten uh, each other's loads here by actually locking arms and starting to push through that door together. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Is anybody here? Yeah. I want to uh, leave you with this. I got uh, The reason I wanted to give you that prayer was not to preach a sermon about it, but to give you this prayer. Uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it, 30 day challenge, 90 day challenge, do whatever challenge you want to do, but at least 30 days. I want you to take this Ephesians chapter one prayer. And I really want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to take it seriously. If you don't have a devotional time, you need to start one today or tomorrow. And if this is all you do for 30 days, so be it. I'll give you an attaboy. I'll be proud of you. Just, I need you to do this. And do it for yourself, but do it for the plan of God. Do it for, you know, Laura and I, the staff, you know, the body of Christ. Just do it. Amen. But the challenge is not a challenge like I dare you. I'm just putting it out there because I want you to do it. 
Um, I want you to take this Ephesians prayer, particularly the verse uh, 16 through 21, I think it is, or 23. I don't. It's the prayer. You can add the last couple of verses on there if you want, up to the end of chapter one. But I want you to put this on your and put it on your calendar. Mark it down. Put it somewhere where you'll actually be reminded to do it, and it'll take you probably a total of. If you really do a decent job, maybe a total of 10 minutes a day. And, uh, you know, I think we could all squeeze in 10 minutes a day. But I want you to take this prayer and I want you to pray it, number one, over yourself. Nothing wrong or selfish about praying this over yourself. Because that's what Kenneth Hagin did. He prayed it over himself for, like I said, six months. And the results were he began to see things that were there all the while, but that he hadn't seen. I want you to pray it over yourself, and secondarily, I want you to pray it over your family. Amen. Family, you know, your your uh, children, grandchildren if you have them. Pray it over your extended family. Amen. Maybe your mom and dad, brothers and sisters, whatever focus in that uh, family arena. And then lastly, uh, man, what did I do with my notes? I must have erased that part on accident. Oh, here it is. Um, Nope, nope, it's gone. Over uh, our community. (coughs) So you got yourself, (coughs) excuse me, your family, and this community. And by community, I mean you can include, uh, you know, other churches, the body of Christ here in this community. You include, uh, you know, those that are in positions of authority, uh, which could be, you know, uh, you know, obviously government. I always think of positions of authority that have a great effect. You know, you think about the school systems. Amen. Those type deals. And listen, if you just prayed this over yourself and your family, I'd be fine with that. If you want to add in a couple extra minutes and pray it over, you know, beyond that, that's that's up to you. But I want you to, you know, make a commitment tonight to you and the Lord to take this prayer and actually pray it. Now, there is a, another prayer uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, and we can talk about that another time. But I just believe that, you know, the Lord laid this on my heart. Um uh, I don't know if you want, I don't care what you do, do whatever you want to do. Um, I really think the Lord laid this on my heart uh, for tonight because I believe that this would be a phenomenal way to start this year. One of those, one of the functions or really one of the, the characteristics of the, 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 uh, the, what the scripture calls principalities, powers, you know, might, dominion, all those things that are the kingdom of darkness, one of their tactics is to blind you and I so it's you know we used to pray I remember when I was just saved probably just a few months you know I had just enough ammunition to be dangerous you know so I'd go praying Lord remove the blinders from the eyes of those who don't believe and that's a good prayer right but it really reveals one of the strategies of the enemy Um, and we think that that's mostly for unsaved but uh, it's it uh, really could go for both categories, saved and unsaved, uh, that there's areas of, how many of y'all have loved ones or, you know, friends, family, whatever, you know, they love the Lord, they're born again, but have not yet seen the light on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? We, probably most of us were there uh, at some point, you know, I don't want nothing to do with that Holy Spirit business or any of that, or there could be some that are saved, love the Lord, but don't believe that healing is the will of God. What is that? Well, there's a little bit of a, 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 what do you call that? Like a blinder there that's set up that when those blinders are removed, we can see beyond that and think, wow, I have actually a full inheritance. And if we can see it, and actually by revelation, if we can see it, we could walk in it. So the power of that prayer is that we would be given spiritual wisdom and revelation so that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened so that we could see all that God. How many believe God has some things? Now, he said it in the the 1 Corinthians 2 as well. Those things, that wisdom has been hidden for ages, 
but now it's revealed to you and I by the Spirit of God that dwells in us. Amen. So just connecting with the Holy Spirit inside said, Holy Spirit, reveal that wisdom to me. Right? That'd be a great little addition to that prayer. Holy Spirit, give me wisdom, which is the same as Ephesians prayer. But he's, the Holy Spirit is in there and he knows everything. He's God and he's in you. So he, the Spirit of God knows the heart of God. He's in your spirit so he can reveal to you and I the heart of God. This is where Christianity really begins to take shape and form and we begin to move out of becoming just a religious body to an actual body that has revelation where we can see the things of God fully. How many are just tired of the devil getting one up over on you? I mean, I, I'm telling you, I, I've seen, the, gosh, the sickness and the, the challenges, the depression, the up and down, the emotional stuff, the stuff in family and marriage and finance. I mean, it's like we should not be ruled over. We should be ruling over. And for us to be able to do that, right? We've got to work together, got to pull together, but we've really got to begin to see some things that we have not seen, amen? Or get back to some things that we were seeing, amen? Do you receive that tonight? Well, look at me, 20 minutes earlier than I usually am, so you could give me an attaboy tonight, all right? Attaboy. Don't expect it too much for next week, though. I'll keep you double time next week. I'm just kidding. Let me pray over you. Father, thank you. Uh, for being so gracious and allowing me to share my heart tonight, I believe, which is your heart. And uh, Lord, we just, uh, we just, I want to lay it all out, put it all out on the line. We've, we've got some, some progress to, to gain and some, some things we need to step into this year, Lord. And uh, we ask you just to give us a spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of you. Open the eyes of our understanding, flood our hearts with light, Lord, that we may see and know the hope of your calling, the glorious riches and the inheritance. Uh, and the saints and the incredible greatness of your power that works in for us who believe according to the work of your mighty power. Father, we thank you for that. And we ask you for wisdom and revelation starting this year. And uh, we trust that as we commit to pray this over ourselves, our families, loved ones, community, Lord, that the eyes of all of our understanding, oh, what a powerful move that could be, Lord. The eyes of all of our understandings being flooded with light, that we can move uh, hand in hand into the fullness of your glory in these last days. Uh, we just thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your word. Protect us as we go. Keep us uh, in your hand. And uh, just thank you in Jesus' name.